In this video, I'm going to talk about the other major ideology, the other major new ideology that emerged in the early 20th century around the same time as Marxism. And this time, I'm talking about fascism. Fascism is similar to Marxism in the way that it demands authoritarian powers for, uh, for the state. But it is a little different from Marxism in that its utopia is not so much creating this equality for all. Instead, it's focused on um, establishing dominance, that it's a type of nationalism on steroids that looks to dominate other societies. Um, and it's based on Nietzschean ideas about um, the Ubermenschen. We talked about this a little bit with uh, German nationalism before. The idea of the supermen who create their own morality. Um, and the Untermenschen, the undermen, the inferior beings who are there to be ruled, there to be dominated. And the goal of fascism is for the particular nation state to assert itself as this nation of supermen and to dominate the rest and dominate other nations. Look at it first in, uh, in Italy with the rise of Mussolini. Mussolini, who begins his career as a Marxist, shows you how closely connected some of these ideologies were. And Mussolini, in the end, chooses um, nationalism and to align his ideas more with nationalism and nationalist domination rather than Marxist domination. But his methods are remarkably similar. His methods of coming to power and approaching power are remarkably similar. He uses uh, the authority of his followers and marches on Rome with 30,000 of them, forces uh, the king of Italy to name him prime minister, and then takes control of the state and concentrates all power in the state under his authority. Education, the press, the army, opposition parties. Again, sounds just like the way Lenin acted in Russia. And then he seeks overseas expansion. And again, this is the way in which fascism is different from Marxism. Fascism seeks to dominate other nations. In Mussolini's case, he seeks to establish an empire in Africa. Or rather, he seeks to establish a Mediterranean empire, but he begins in Africa with a brutal campaign uh, against the Ethiopians, who he considers to be inferior beings. He and his followers considered to be inferior beings. And so that's the setup in Italy. Of course, we'll talk more about this when I talk about World War II. Now we come to the more famous example of fascism, which is Nazism. Nazism is a type of fascism that combines fascism with racism. Now, when you have this idea of nationalism on steroids, it's very easy to make that segue to racism. But racism wasn't necessarily built into fascism. But it is necessarily built, an anti-Semitic attitude is necessarily built into Nazism. And the Nazi party is founded after World War I by a lot of Germans who feel embittered by the defeat of Germany, by the way Germany was treated uh, in its defeat, and blame this defeat on those who are not part of the war effort, particularly German Jews. In 1921, Adolf Hitler becomes the leader of the Nazi party. Um, and leads an attempted coup two years later. The German economy collapses because of the reparations they're being forced to pay after Versailles, and the French take over and occupy a part of Germany until the reparations are paid. Again, the Germans are kind of behaving the way the Prussians did after the Franco-Prussian War. That's certainly it's in the mind of the French. Hitler sees this as an oppression of Germany, and he leads a coup, um, trying to overthrow the Weimar Republic and take control of the country. The coup is not successful, uh, and Hitler goes to prison, during which time he writes his autobiography, he sets out his program, he returns after he's released from prison, he returns to power um, within his party, more influential than ever, and begins winning elections. 
Um, and his party becomes one of the leading parties in Germany in 1932, and Hitler himself uh, becomes chancellor. This time, uh, the Nazis rise to power in large part because of the economic misery that Germans are suffering as a result of the Treaty of Versailles and the reparations combined with the Great Depression, which is having a worldwide uh, effect. So Hitler becomes chancellor of Germany. Shortly after this, uh, a Marxist revolutionary sets fire to the Reichstag, the German parliamentary building. So there, people are afraid of Hitler and afraid of the Nazis in Germany. They're also afraid of Marxist, Marxist revolutionaries, Marxist terrorist attacks, just like we talked about in Russia. And so uh, Hitler takes advantage of this act of terrorism to demand uh, extra powers for himself and for his cabinet and kind of like Mussolini and like Lenin takes control of the state and removes any checks on his authority and then afterwards he oversees the expansion of uh, German dominance to also control Austria remember this overseas ex not overseas in this case but this expansion and dominance of other nation states is a hallmark of fascism Last example that I want to talk about in this chapter is the case of the Spanish Civil War. This is an interesting case because it's not really any more considered by historians an example of fascism, but it is considered an example of an authoritarian state developing in the early 20th century. So it fits the pattern that we're exploring here. Spain as we talked about in the past, became weaker in the 19th century after the fall of its empire to Napoleon. But it doesn't adopt a lot of Enlightenment ideas in the 19th century. And it means when uh, more modern ideas come to Spain in the 20th century, they come in a rush and they come in a way that's very radical. In 1936, again, you have Marxist revolutionaries who overthrow the monarchy, take control of the government and establish a new constitution that eliminates the role of public religion uh, from Spanish society. And this is a big problem for many people in Spain at the time. And it leads to another rebellion, a counter rebellion, if you will, led by Francisco Franco that turns into a civil war. Franco's nationalists against the Marxist Republicans. Both receive outside aid, the Republicans from Stalin and the Soviet Union, the nationalists from Hitler and Mussolini and those fascist states, both of which are kind of trying out new military ideas using this theater. But for some people, for people from a more uh, Republican uh, Marxist perspective, this is seen as the tyranny of a right wing Franco against the freedom of communism. For uh, people who are more sympathetic to Franco, this is seen as an attempted communist takeover, an attempt to persecute and wipe out Christianity in Spain. And so uh, this is a very fiercely fought conflict. It's a very bitter conflict. There are a lot of casualties. Uh, there are atrocities committed by both sides. In the end, the nationalists are successful. The last province to hold out against them is Catalonia, which retains uh, separatist ambitions, ambitions to be uh, independent of the rest of Spain. You see some of that uh, still in uh, the 21st century. Franco governs in a highly authoritarian way for the next uh, 35, 40 years or so uh, before ceding his power to his pupil, uh, who is an heir to the Spanish royal family and rehabilitating the Spanish royal family which then transitions Spain from a monarchy into a liberal democracy over the course of the last part of the 20th century. As I say, Franco ruled Spain in an extremely authoritarian manner. He saw this as necessary to avoid further Marxist uh, revolutions. Um, Today, despite his authoritarianism, he's not considered a fascist because unlike Mussolini and Hitler, he doesn't attempt to take over and to dominate uh, other countries. He simply seeks to maintain uh, something approaching the status quo in his own country. Uh, so there you have it for fascism, hyper-nationalism, and we'll talk about World War II next time.